In my mind, there was suddenly great clarity. The contest had shown me that while I did a lot of things right, I also did a few things almost comically wrong. And that's when I knew. I wasn't untalented. I was simply uninformed. And lucky for me, I was living in an information age. In the media technology fluorescence of the 80s, with its video games, personal computers, and Sony Walkmen, no innovation transformed living rooms more profoundly than the VCR. And the cancel key. F we can't. In the exploding market for guitar instructional videos, a company called Starlix had the most radio-friendly lineup, with guys like Steve Lukather from Toto, Jeff Watson from Night Ranger, and Carlos Cavazzo of Quiet Riot. Hot Licks had rootsy players like Danny Gatton and James Burton, and REH had a roster of technical hard rock players like Paul Gilbert, Richie Kotzen, and Chris Impelitari. It seemed like all the big guitar heroes had tapes. All, that is, but one. Like probably many teenagers, I'd never actually seen Yngwie play live. Yngwie's MTV videos were all smoke machines and lip syncing, and the occasional karate chop, none of which was terribly useful for unraveling the baffling conundrum of Yngwie's abilities. Apparently, Yngwie live concert bootlegs had traded hands among the conoscenti since the mid-80s. But I didn't know about them at the time. For most of us, this was a printed media world. Aside from the magazines, we subsisted on medley-style instruction books sold in record stores. At best, these contained brief excerpts labeled as in the style of a particular band or player. If you were lucky, there might even be tablature, but you could never be sure how accurate it was. When that wasn't available, you could try piano arrangements of popular rock songs. Rather than suffer the indignity of buying such a thing, guys would try and memorize it in the store. Opportunities for practicing guitarists to study actual footage of their heroes were incredibly limited. So when I learned that Ingve had finally released an instructional video. Hi, welcome to the video. There was no hesitation. I had saved up from my summer job as music director at the day camp, and I ran right out and got it. In possession of such awesome power, this was no time for restraint. I would unseal the hidden alchemy by which the master glided across the strings in perfectly interlocking quatrefoils of sound. A magic I had come to know as descending force. With the Crusader's command of the fast forward button, I would teleport instantly to this most guarded well of souls, whereupon I would profane with my mortal hands the divine power of... Okay, now that was not what I was expecting. He played it again slow, but slow for Yngwie is kind of like slow for an electron. So I looked at the booklet that came with the tape. They had it notated two notes per string. Two on the B string, and two on the E. But that's still... Wait, wait a minute. Yngwie's fours didn't move across the strings at all. 
through a stroke of fretboard legere domain, he was just playing the same string the whole time. The tape actually featured the ascending version of the lick, but Ingve's deviously subversive solution was the same either way. By sliding his hand up the neck with each repetition, he could ingeniously cycle the pattern higher without moving to a new string. This meant that the pinky played both the final note of the pattern and the first note of the subsequent pattern. Normally, playing two successive notes with the same finger produced a decidedly mannerist sound known as a slide. This could be further exaggerated for cartoonish effect. But Ingve's sliding had no sonic effect. The brief motion of the pinky from one fret to the other took place in the tiny space of dead time between one picking motion and the next. This was like the vertical blanking interval on an analog television set, when the beam reaches the bottom and the picture goes dark for a brief instant. Played quickly enough, the blank is unnoticeable and the images blend into a smoothly moving picture. But Ingve played so fast that when I first watched the sequence, it actually took me a couple rewinds before I realized what I was seeing. If the high monks of notation, laboring in their mountaintop transcriptoria, could not divine the secrets of Ingve's technique, even with video evidence, it only convinced me that I never had much chance of figuring any of this out with the SK-1 alone. With so many mysteries to solve, I had no time for courtyard parties. Because in Professor Malmsteen's College of Medieval Metal, my new major, was minor. The solution to the arpeggio mystery had been right under my nose, and the idea was that instead of using individual pick strokes to play notes on different strings, you used one pick motion that flowed or swept across multiple strings at once. Now, I'd known about sweeping in high school. The problem was, I had it all wrong. If I held down a chord with my left hand and swept the pick across the strings with my right, what I got was a kind of sonic blur where the notes ran together. This is like playing an arpeggio on a piano with the damper pedal held down. You could hear the individual notes, but you could also hear that they overlapped. Early 60s guitarists did this all the time. Even Eddie Van Halen did something similar. It sounded fine, but the effect was nothing like Ingve's startling articulation. So I always assumed Ingve was doing something else. And in a way, he was. Ingve's right hand was making one movement across the strings. But the trick was that his left hand fingers only touched the fretboard the instant the pick hit the string. When fretting the next note, he simultaneously unfretted the previous one. There was no way the notes could run together because he only fretted them for their exact duration and not a moment longer. It was a small but subtle distinction that made all the difference. If I fretted individual notes, I got Ingve. If I swept a chord, I got reggae. Another thing I noticed right away was the way that Ingve held his pick. I knew that most rock guitarists held the pick at an angle against the string. In other words, instead of using the flat side of the pick, they used a little bit of the edge to attack the note. This made a softer sound because the edge of the pick tended to slide over the top of the string. And this came in handy for playing heavy metal rhythm parts, where I could use it in combination with muting or deadening the string with the side of the palm. It also came in handy for faster playing because the edge of the pick presented less resistance to the string as it moved back and forth. I'd actually been doing this since very early on. In fact, I have footage of it from a ninth grade project where we did a Ghostbusters inspired documentary about parapsychology. I was clearly holding the pick so that the edge sliced across the strings as I played. 
What's interesting is how I was doing it. Imagine an idealized scenario where the pick is at a right angle to the guitar and perfectly parallel to the strings. The edge that points toward the headstock could be called the leading edge, while the opposite edge that points toward the bridge would be the trailing edge. For whatever reason, I'd been using the trailing edge of the pick to attack the strings. This meant I was holding the pick with a bend in the wrist and the fingers. And when I did this, it felt like the pick might fly out of my hand if I played a hard enough downstroke. But Ingve's method was exactly the reverse. When I held the pick like he did, with the leading edge against the string, the thumb presented a backstop against the string's resistance, and the pick felt less likely to pop out of my hand. I immediately switched over, and although it was a little weird at first, it quickly became second nature. Hi, welcome to the video. My name is Ingve Malmsteen, J. Malmsteen, by the way. Yeah. The Ingve video was in heavy rotation in my dorm room. You should tune to this note. But as simple as the sweeping and fours idea seemed on paper, I still wasn't any good at them. I'd never mastered synchronization between the hands. At the same time, I was also taking a couple psychology classes, and one of the topics we talked about turned out to be pretty relevant to the synchronization problem. It was called chunking. Apparently, human brains can just barely hold seven items in short-term memory. But by grouping seemingly random data into intelligible chunks, could turbocharge the learning process. Each chunk only counted as one item to memorize, but you could unpack it later into almost unlimited components. Chunking was also the whole idea behind area codes. I say New York, you say 212. I say LA, you say 213. Replacing area codes with city names gave you a 3x multiplier on what you could memorize. If I gave you seven cities, that allowed you to recall 21 numbers. Knowing this, I began to realize that Ingve's single string licks were chunkable. For example, the descending fours lick was really a repeating pattern. Each pattern began on a downstroke, contained two interior notes, and ended on an upstroke for a total of four notes. That means that when Ingve connected these patterns, each four-note grouping always began on a downstroke. Not only that, but if I line these four-note groupings up against a beat, the first note of each grouping always lined up with the count. This rhythm turned the first note of each pattern into a kind of landmark. By focusing on the landmark, I could simply ignore the intervening notes and the pattern would still be perfectly synchronized, like a physio-auditory form of chunking. Because I was only paying attention to every fourth note, I could play four times faster without getting lost. And the descending fours pattern wasn't the only Ingve pattern that worked this way. This six note pattern was impressive because it offered a six to one compression ratio. If I played the pattern as 16th note triplets, then I could fit all six notes inside of one chunk. Just like the descending fours lick, every six note chunk began with an obvious downstroke. And that was the power of even-numbered chunking. If you could do four, then you could do six. And if you could fit six things in a box, then how about eight? 